What's up y'all? You've made it to the psychedelic region of the internet. Today I'm going to tell you my psychedelic origin story. The trail of breadcrumbs that I believe some greater force, perhaps the mushroom, was calling me with. This is what made me a psychedelic person. What's up everybody? Welcome back to my channel. This is a space where I'm creating stories and conversations about the visionary and ineffable things that happen to me and others on psychedelics and in dreams, attempting to F the ineffable. This channel was made as an answer to Tim Leary and Terence McKenna's call to find the others. To find like-minded seekers and talk about these amazing experiences and build maps of meaning in hyperspace. Today we're going back to the beginning. I think some people are built for psychedelics just like some people are built for basketball or music. Just like my inspiration Terence McKenna, I was a sensitive nerd with an extremely vivid imagination. But there are some experiences that, looking back, I would consider pre-psychedelic. One of the earliest things I can think back to was a dream that I had when I was three or four years old. I went outside and it was in the middle of the night. On the house's driveways across the street from mine, I saw these cardboard cutouts. One that looked like the moon, one that looked like the sun, and then one that looked like a star. Now looking back to this now, it makes me think of archetypal figures of the sun, the moon, and stars. If you look at some of the old drawings found in alchemy, you'll see a lot of figures that have the faces represented as the sun and the moon. Maybe it had something to do with that. Another early experience I remember is in the third grade, we got to see a caterpillar go through metamorphosis and we saw it, the whole process going over the span of a few months. We saw the caterpillar go into the cocoon and then eventually it turned into a monarch butterfly. My memory of seeing this butterfly hatch and fly and just seeing how beautiful it was, it really exceeded language. And it really makes me think of this Terence McKenna quote where he talks about how when we put meaning and language on things it kind of dampens their beauty because when you're a child and you see a butterfly for the first time like that it's just this beautiful magical shining iridescent piece of magic then your parent tells you that's a butterfly so now all of a sudden it's encapsulated it's compartmentalized which obviously that has a function and a purpose, but I think there is something to be said about the beauty of that being kind of reduced by putting a name on it. I think of this early experience of seeing the butterfly with no labels, just the pure beauty and being totally engrossed in that moment when I saw it. I think of that as very psychedelic. I didn't know what to call it at that time, but now I would call that psychedelic, for sure. Another thing that kind of sets this all up was that I was a huge fan of Dragon Ball Z. So when I was about 12 to 15 years old, I was totally convinced that I had key energy, that I could harness this life force energy within me and that I could create like an energy ball, you know, like on Dragon Ball Z. One time when I was 15, I actually like freaked out calling my friends because I was breathing. I thought what I felt was the energy pushing my hands apart and then breathe, bringing them together, which you could probably explain that away by saying, you know, when you breathe in, your lungs expand and, and your muscles contract. So that's why your, your hands are moving. But I was pretty convinced and I spent a lot of time focusing on this energy and I would usually hold it right here, kind of in my center. So when I was 12 or 13 years old, I had never done any kind of drug before at that point, but I used to fall asleep listening to music. And I remember stuff got kind of trippy at some points. I remember when I was 12 years old, I would fall asleep listening to Jimi Hendrix and I remember on some of his songs they got super trippy and when you're in that sleepy state of mind halfway between sleep and being awake you're open to that stuff it's like the music totally like fills your consciousness and you become the music it's kind of like a form of ego death so this music of Jimi Hendrix would just fill my mind and it was my first real 
taste of psychedelic consciousness. And the same thing would happen a couple years later when I was listening to the Mars Volta. I would fall asleep listening to their albums and play Francis the Mute, and the same thing would happen. I would be in that liminal zone between sleep and wake, and I would hear their music just totally inflating my mind, and it was super trippy. So this is where we start to get into what I would consider the true beginnings of my psychedelic journey. So the very first thing that ever occurred to me that was visionary or anything related to what my life is like now was when I was 15 years old. My favorite band at the time was called The Fall of Troy and I was listening to their music. Uh, the song that I had on was called Ghost Ship. I think it was Ghost Ship Part 4 or Ghost Ship Part 5. And when I was listening to it, I closed my eyes. And if you've seen any of my other videos, you know I talk about seeing like 3D models in my head, like in my dodecahedron lamp video. I see these spinning, rotating models in my head, and this one time when I was 15 was the very first time I saw that. And I was listening to The Fall of Troy, and I saw the guitarist for The Fall of Troy doing his moves where he's kind of like thrashing around, but there's this kind of like gracefulness to it. It's kind of a mixture between total chaos and like demolition and destruction and grace and like a dance move. It's kind of this weird middle ground. And in my head, I saw the guitarist rotating and I saw his movements and his energy, kind of his aura, rotating in my head. I heard the word in my head, archetype. And at that time I had no idea what it meant, but all I know is that I saw this rotating model. It seemed like it was kung fu energy. I'll put a little video up here so you can see the kind of movements that I'm talking about. But it was very like graceful yet destructive energy. So. That's the best I can think of is Kung Fu energy. I just kind of kept it to myself. I was like, hmm, archetype. Okay. I might have looked it up, but I didn't really have a clear idea of what archetype meant. It was very interesting that that was a word that popped into my head at that time because it would later go on to be extremely significant. Fast forward a few years and I was able to actually ask the Fall of Troy an interview question because my friends had a podcast and they had like a VIP meetup thing and uh, I happened to be able to ask the Fall of Troy a question. There's actually a video of of me asking this question and them answering. But before I play that, let me just start off by saying I didn't know what I was gonna ask them in advance, but as they were talking in the original interview, they mentioned that their Ghost Ship album was their psychedelic period. And that's the thing I was listening to whenever I heard the word archetype in my head. So it's pretty crazy now looking back that perhaps the mushroom kind of leapt out of that sound and somehow called me to it through this music. So I'm gonna go ahead and play the video and then you hear for yourself. That's a really special record to me, man, too, because that was, if I'm not, is that the only, I mean, I'm sure they're all concept records, but is that the one that is kind of... Yeah, you, that was our hallucinogenic phase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's up, guys? Hi. Hi hey. Tom. Hello. Congratulations on the new album. I've been jamming that, and it's like uh, adrenaline to the chest. Nice. Man, it just gets Uma me pumped Thurman. every day. Yeah, Uma Thurman. Uh, but uh, going back when you mentioned uh, a hallucinogenic phase, I'm a big geek with all of that mm. stuff, so I'm just really curious. Was How did a psychedelic influence come into play? Was it with the concepts or do you were jamming just uh, out in space all, like that? All of them. I yeah. Think, yeah. It, made, it made fucking around with a delay pedal for 15 minutes sound good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then we were like, and then the sailor gets on another <laughs> ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then there's a demon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's literally I mean, what it was like. Right, right. But it also like, it's also kind of like this trip we're having right now. Too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So going back in time again, now let's say I'm about 16, 17 years old, this is when my favorite band was Muse. And when I was listening to Muse, I would get these really mysterious vibes that I didn't know how to put my finger on. Now I would call that psychedelic. Muse isn't the ideal version of what you would call a psychedelic band. But eventually I found out that Muse 
did mushrooms and a lot of their songs were written on mushrooms or performed on mushrooms when they were in the studio and so I kind of thought huh maybe there's something to do with that why I'm getting this really weird vibe that something was pulling me towards that sound not only was it this mysterious psychedelic vibe that I was getting but they had songs that were in music videos that were about leaving the planet and apocalyptic feelings like the world could be ending soon and that we need to escape the earth and in my mind these ideas of leaving the earth and apocalypse and the mushroom are all connected you hear terence mckenna talk about it a lot when he says the mushroom says stuff like this is what it's like when a species prepares to depart the stars so these are all connections that i'm making after the fact now that i've had experiences and i've dived deep into this stuff also at that time i felt inclined to learn more about subconscious that became my fascination when i was about 17 that subconscious is where you get your best music that all the really good music must be coming from your subconscious which that really was like the first step I needed to go to get to the unconscious. So it's interesting that I went level by level. I went from the conscious mind to the subconscious to the unconscious. I thought that the subconscious was the secret to good music. So fast forward a little bit more. Now we're into young adulthood. I'm about 18 years old and I smoke weed for the first time. This deserves its own story, but let's just say I listened to my friend play drums the first time I got high and listened to music and it totally blew my mind. Shortly after that, I wrote my first song, High, which I can link you to the album that my band made, that song's on there, it's called Light Dream. As soon as I got high and tried to play music for the first time, this idea came out of me. The, the guitar riff and the vocal part all flowed out of me like I was in some kind of trance. I really believe now that weed and psychedelics tap you into those unconscious flows, especially when music is involved. Things can flow out of you that are not easily accessible in your conscious mind. Shortly after my first weed experience, I took acid for the first time, which I made a video about my first big acid trip. Shortly after my first acid trip, I experienced astral projection for the first and only time in my life. I have some friends who talk about it pretty often and they're really into that side of things, the astral projection, but it only happened to me once. And this was also in one of those liminal zones between sleep and wakefulness. What happened was I was in that sleepy state of mind. I had my eyes closed, but I could see myself in my own room and I could see through my walls and I could see the space going out beyond that infinitely. It was like all of the walls were see-through and I could see basically through my walls into deep space going all the way. And this was after my acid trip where I experienced cosmic consciousness. I was still in that state of mind. Very soon after that, I experienced my first archetypal dream. I had a dream of what Carl Jung calls the anima. So this deserves its own video too, but basically as a brief description and a brief retelling of the dream, the anima is what Carl Jung calls the feminine component of the male psyche. So according to Carl Jung, the anima is basically your creative soul internally. And in a man, in a typical male, or you could say or a masculine oriented person, the anima is your unconscious feminine side. And vice versa for a feminine oriented person, that is called the animus and it's their masculine unconscious. I had a dream of the anima, and this was before I knew what the anima was, and basically I was looking into the eyes of a woman, and it took the form of a girl that I knew, and basically I looked into her eyes, and then it was like I dove into their eyes, and then inside of the eyes, I was swimming in the DNA, and I saw the DNA, and I felt like this dance between me and the anima was like the meeting of DNA, and it took on this kind of macrocosmic feel. Like it was both microscopically what was going on, the dance of DNA, and in the big picture, it was like two stars orbiting each other. 
and it seemed to have these two levels to it, this above level and this below level. Really interesting. And later in life, these anima dreams would continue. And that's my most frequently recurring dream is the anima dream. So I won't get too deep into it, but according to Carl Jung, the anima evolves over time. It evolves into more mature and complex versions of itself. So let's say when you start off to integrate your anima, it's basically if you're a masculine oriented person that your anima is a teenage girl in the beginning. And then as time goes, your inner woman becomes a more mature woman. That's one way to put it. I believe very strongly in this stuff, by the way. I think it is totally true. In my interview with uh, Vinyl Williams, they talk about how they make music that is influenced by the anima and trying to represent this inner feminine of the psyche. And that's a huge reason why I'm attracted to the music of Vinyl Williams is because they embrace stuff like that. And I try to do that in my own art as well. And I don't really hear a lot of people other than that talking about it. So super interesting to hear that stuff playing out in real life. So anima is an archetype, right? And I've also had other dreams of archetypes. One would be called the Cynex. According to Carl Jung, the Cynex is like the wise old sage archetype. So you, these come in the form of like a teacher. I've had this dream occur where I see like some old 70s prog rock guitar player who's like backstage with me and my buddies and like giving us tips on how to play a better show, a musical master, right? And I've also had dreams where Cornell West the philosopher took me into his home to protect me because I was some kind of political refugee. I guess I said something that got me in trouble and Cornell West took me in and he was giving me advice and love and wisdom. So that would be categorized under the Cynex archetype. So I've had a lot of dreams that have to do with this stuff. Shortly after I started having these dreams of anima, my friend gave me a book by Carl Jung called Man and His Symbols. This is a really good introductory book for Carl Jung. It gets kind of the overview of a lot of his ideas, and it's where a lot of these ideas about archetypes and anima were introduced to me for the first time. And one of the terms that I heard for the first time, which now is super important to me, is the collective unconscious. So I really believe that all these things that are happening to me are coming from the collective unconscious. There is this connection to the mushroom that threads through the entire thing. It's pretty weird, but I've learned such is the nature when you're dealing with a psychedelic mushroom that's potentially a space alien. All of this stuff has continued since then, and I just wanted to kind of get the first part of the story, so I'm going to tell you even more stories that are really weird, that have to do with all this stuff, the collective unconscious, the mushroom, archetypes, symbols being revealed to me in my visions, and alchemy and all this stuff is tied together. The Philosopher's Stone, all of it has to do with this. I don't know what it is, but I've learned to respect it and follow the breadcrumbs and see where it takes me. It took me a really long time to actually give these experiences credibility and integrate them, where for a long time I would just live my life as usual and think about how weird that was. It's been proven that it's best to listen to your own intuition and commit yourself to feeding your brain, whether that's listening to music, reading Carl Jung, or studying alchemy or meditation. Now I'm at a point where I'm fascinated and committed to this journey with whatever unexpected turns it presents I've learned to listen I'm gonna make this the first video to a new playlist called breadcrumbs to the unconscious where I trace the steps in this archetypal unfoldment and I've mentioned this in a couple of my YouTube update videos that I want to turn this all into a book because it's really turning into a great story and it's just happening to me I don't have to write any of this I just got to write it down so check out my other playlists of trip reports, travel, and interviews. So that's going to be it for this one. Thanks for hearing my story as usual. And uh, I always really appreciate whoever takes the time to listen to my stories and hear me out. And I hope you found this interesting. And I'll see you when I make my next one. All right. Peace.